I'm going to turn our attention to Psalm 36. I mean, I'm not giving you anything shocking when I tell you that you and I are living in a dangerous world. There are many dangerous threats to our physical well-being, obviously, and many very dangerous threats to our spiritual well-being. Now, Scripture, being the inspired Word of God, informs us that the reason for this is that we currently live between two perfect worlds. Initially, there were perfect conditions that did exist upon the creation of the earth and the heavens above, along with the inception of the human race by Almighty God. However, as a result of man's deliberate disobedience, deliberate rebellion to God, all kinds of threats to our well-being have come about, both physically and spiritually. And yet at the same time, the Bible is clear that our Creator God is right on schedule to restore this universe to a perfect sin-free status, something worth knowing, something worth anticipating, given the ill effects of our sin that we experience in connection with ourselves and with others and the world in general. As the Apostle Peter puts it in 2 Peter 3.13, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Meanwhile, however, the world in which we live is a dangerous place. Evil and the consequences of man's sin have brought about a state of existence where men and women are anxious about their lives and, and they find all kinds of tensions in their relationships with other people. People fret about their life today for a host of reasons, and, and often they are consumed by their fears of tomorrow. Some for good reason, because they have spurned their Creator God and rejected His provision of mercy and grace and forgiveness through His Son, Jesus Christ. But others, others who have been reconciled with God the Father through placing their faith, their, their trust in the Son of God, often find themselves forgetting their identity in Christ and, and what this means for, for their lives. For they have been given a place of refuge, even in the midst of the trials and, and obstacles in life that they face. It's a refuge that can be overlooked, especially if we're passing through an unexpected dark tunnel along life's journey. And it's a refuge that can eliminate fears. It can eliminate anxieties and, and the inner turmoil that naturally tends to boil up to the surface in our lives. There's a wonderful description of what being reconciled with God means in terms of living our lives under His care, a consoling description that affirms that we are awash in a sea of God's love. And that picture, as I said, is given to us in Psalm 36. I love this psalm. Uh, this is a powerful psalm. Uh, it's a beautifully written psalm. And the imagery that's presented there takes me back to the the earliest days of my childhood, you know, when I lived on a, on a farm in the, in the very southern tip of Texas. And as a kid, I was four or five years old, somewhere in there, one of my favorite jobs on that farm was to gather eggs. <laughs> yes, you know, I was a kid. It was a long row of nests that was inside our hen house there, and uh, chickens also roosted in there at night. But these eggs had to be gathered daily. And because if they weren't, then a hen might become a setter. And unless you have chickens, you might want to know that a setter is a hen that decides that she wants to assemble a collection of eggs for herself. And uh, she wants to raise a little brood of chicks. Uh, her nesting urge kind of takes over. And uh, even though the eggs were collected daily uh, from the hen house, there, were, there was always a renegade hen or two. You know, they, they, they'd find a secret place outside the, the hen house to, to, to make a, a makeshift nest and, and lay their eggs. So, you know, fairly often, 
Uh, a mother hen with a brood of several chicks would appear one day and they'd be roaming around the farmyard. Now, personally, as a kid, I was thrilled <laughs> because I love to see this, this little bunch of, of chicks uh, going around. I mean, there aren't really many things cuter, are there, than little chicks? Uh, or, or little ducklings, for that matter, you know? And I'd follow this little group of, of chicks around with their mother as their, hen, as, their, as their mother hen led them around. And she would scratch for food, you know, and then she steps back and all the little chicks run in front of her. And they're looking for tidbits of food. And uh, as a group, this, this, this little band would wander around the barnyard. And usually they wouldn't go too far from their mother. But whenever the threat of danger was there, perceived danger or not, the mother hen would, would spread her wings low to the ground, do a little clucking, and the little chicks would race under those outstretched wings for safety. Yeah? You know, the little guys, he's cozy, he's safe, he's secure. You know, these little guys might not have had a clue of what that danger might be, but, but they, you can see them kind of peering out into the world from underneath the safety of their mother's sheltering wing. Now, you know, there's a lot of species of birds that do that. Uh, they do the same thing to protect their fledglings. And in our passage today, David uses this very vivid image from nature in connection with our relationship with Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, our Creator. And he does so in Psalm 36. If you have your Bibles, you might turn there. We're only going to look at a small portion of it today. It's not a long psalm, it's only 12 verses, but nonetheless, we're kind of anchoring in the middle, verses 7, 8, and 9, where David says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God! Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. You know, if you leave here this morning with, with only one thing, I hope it's this, that the safest, the most secure place you can be in this world is under the protective shelter offered you by your loving Heavenly Father. Remember that, and, 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 and like a chick to its mother, I hope you will scurry under those mighty outstretched wings that, that David describes here. Indeed, you know, in close proximity with our Lord, that is the place to find refuge from all forms of danger that surround us in this present world in which we live. Look at verse 7 in particular, where he says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God! And therefore the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. You know, if you are a child of God, if you've entered the family of God through placing your trust, your faith in Christ as Savior, what a beautiful image this is for you. It's an invitation to humbly come to God in fellowship, you know, to taste, to, to find His loving kindness as it envelops you. Obviously, baby chicks are quite vulnerable in life. They're defenseless, literally, against any and all predators. They're cute, but they're really quite helpless. And, and when we see through all the human bravado that's out there in the world, including our own hearts at times, we have to admit that we're about as helpless as one of those baby chicks. Not all of us are as cute as a baby chick, <laughs> But all of us are ultimately as helpless with, with very little in this fallen, this, this broken, very dangerous world that's under our control. So the strongest motive for us to make a beeline to the outstretched wings of our Creator God, David says, is the recognition of His loving kindness toward us. And in this psalm, David, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, goes out of his way to dwell on that loving kindness. Honestly, I, I think you and I need to dwell more 
on God's loving kindness toward us every day of our lives. You know, and, and if you and I don't understand the depth of God's love for us, then we're very likely to wander all over the barnyard, naively, unnecessarily, which will take us to places that we don't want to go. So this morning, let's give some thought to the amazing love God has for you and me as his child. Now, in the first four, four verses of this psalm, David describes uh, an evildoer, uh, a, a wicked man who mutters in his own heart his godlessness. Such a man he describes as arrogant, having complete disregard of God in his life and in the world for that matter. And so with obstinate determination, this evildoer plans and plots his actions in life, total forgetfulness of God. And sadly, our, our present world is full of such people. Despite what they tell themselves, the ultimate fate of such thinking and such living is disastrous. David points that out in verse 12, where he says, There the workers of iniquity have fallen, they have been cast down, and are not able to rise. I mean, really, to pit yourself against Almighty God, that's not only sinful, that's downright foolish. But, but such is the deception of the human heart and unbelief. And then immediately after that description, describing that perverse mindset of a, of a godless person, David turns the focus upon the perfect character, the perfect nature of God, stressing the Lord's unfailing and boundless love for His people. Here's a question for you at this point. What immediately comes to your mind when you think of God? I mean, what is the first thing that pops into your mind at the mention of God? And, you know, for a lot, I think it's judge. For others, it's, it's wrath. Others picture him as a harsh taskmaster. Or perhaps they might think of him as, as distant, a distant God from their life situation. Or maybe not very approachable. Still, there are a lot who always think that God is displeased with them. <laughs> and only at best tolerates them in his family. Well, see, verse 7 furnishes with the correct answer to that question. The first thing that should enter your mind and my mind about God is his loving kindness. No person on this planet can begin to offer you the kind of unceasing love that is lavished upon you by your heavenly Father. Underneath the, the shadow of His mighty wings, you are truly safe. You are truly secure today, tomorrow, and forever. And, and I want you to see how forcefully David drives home this reality to us in this psalm. His words here reflect some very deep thoughts, exquisitely deep thoughts, theologically about God, thoughts that we could spend a great deal of time on, contemplating if we had time, but this morning we can only touch on them. But I want you to begin by looking in verse 5, and depending on how it's translated in your English translation, you, you find in the Hebrew it's the very same word that he uses in verse 7. It's the word has said. And it usually is translated loving kindness, unfailing love, sometimes mercy. And sometimes our English translations translate this very same word differently in verse 5 than in verse 7. Sometimes it's the same translation. But it's the same, it's the same Hebrew word. And, and the concept here is basically equivalent to the, to the New Testament concept of love. And perhaps even a bit more precisely to the New Testament concept of grace. In essence, God's Hesod pictures an active love that's, that's being communicated to beings that are inferior, created beings, in fact, 
that might well expect something else to befall them. The idea here is similar to a general who, who comes to a, a, a group of, of arrogant mutineers and he carries a pardon in his hand and, and speaks words of, of kindness instead of coming to them with a writ of condemnation and imposing a death sentence upon them. It's just a tremendous picture of what happens to us when we come to God's Son, Jesus Christ, and, and place our trust in Him as Lord and Savior. We deserve condemnation and death, but God comes to us through Christ with forgiveness and blessing. So you see, the issue before us this morning is not that we deserve God's loving kindness that David talks about here. The issue is the fact of it because we're in His family through Christ. It's the very same thought that the Apostle John expresses in 1 John 4 when he states, God is love. In fact, his son of David's that which he speaks of God's love, his, his, his loving kindness, it, it proves to be the, the root, the basis for really all of God's character. His loving kindness is the foundation from which he acts. The great uh, Scottish pastor and scholar Alexander McLaren puts it this way, the last voice that sounds from the completed history of the world will have the same message, the ultimate word of all revelation the end of the whole of the majestic unfolding of God's purposes will be the proclamation to the four corners of the world. The name of God is love. In other words, the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega of God beginning and, and crowning and summing up all His being and work is this Hebrew word, His loving kindness. God is great in His loving kindness toward us, even, even though we do not deserve it. And so often, from a practical standpoint, we fail to appreciate it. We, we forget that reality. Now, again, look how David takes this and sandwiches three complementing aspects of God's character, aspects that he directly connects to God's loving kindness. And those three complementing aspects are found in verses 5 and 6, where he says that God's faithfulness reaches to the clouds, that His righteousness is like the great mountains, and His judgments are like the deep, the great deep of the ocean. Boy, as, as beautiful as they are deep, those truths cement God's trustworthiness in terms of His great love for you and for me. His faithfulness is far above all comprehension. That's the truth behind this poetic expression that he uses that reaches into the clouds. God is utterly and entirely faithful. You and I never have, we've never seen, we've never experienced this kind of faithfulness anywhere else. God never fails you. He doesn't forget you. He never falters in His loving kindness toward you. Nor does he go back on any of his declarations, none of his promises. His loving kindness literally endures forever. And let's not forget that also his righteousness is like the great mountains. In other words, God is upright in all his ways. Spurgeon said this, he said, the firm and unmoved, lofty and sublime, as winds and hurricanes cannot shake an alp, so the righteousness of God is never in any degree affected by circumstances. He is always just. Now see, that's, that, that's tremendously reassuring to us who live in a world that's full of corruption at all levels. God is incorruptible in His righteousness. And so living under those outstretched wings of His Whatsoever things are lovely, good, pure, and right, 
that's what God practices toward His, His people. He's the archetype of all that is excellent. He's the, the obviously the ideal of all moral completeness. And so reflecting upon God's righteousness, see, we, we know that He is totally trustworthy to have our best interests at heart as He showers us with this, with this loving kindness. And also, David points out in here, in verse 6, that his judgments are like a great deep. Depths of the ocean. Now, the word judgments here has nothing to do with his punitive actions toward evildoers. He's not talking about judgment in that sense. What he's talking about here is all of God's decisions, all of God's plans and acts with respect to human beings. His judgments are expressions of his thoughts. And these thoughts were always thoughts of good, never of evil. But they are deeper than our thoughts. We're not always going to understand his thoughts, obviously, and yet, and yet the point is that we can trust them, knowing that actually we prefer God's judgments, his decisions, his choices, his plans above our own because of who God is. You know, there are a lot of Bible scholars who think that this powerful psalm, Psalm 36, was in Paul's mind when he exclaimed, how unsearchable are your judgments and how unfathomable your ways. In Romans eleven thirty three, Again, we don't have to understand God's decisions in connection with every aspect of our lives, but we can certainly trust in them. So, David, after he presents these three magnificent aspects of God's character, he then returns to God's loving kindness in verse 7. But now you notice he adds the word precious. Precious. Now that little word marks a change of scale for us. From the large scale he's been talking about, he narrows it down to the intimate and the personal scale in which we bring loving kindness to bear on our own personal lives, coupled with, coupled with God's faithfulness, His righteousness, and His judgments in our behalf. Therefore, he says, therefore, what do we do? Seeing Understanding God's boundless, unfailing, unmatchable, loving kindness that's operative in our lives, we put our trust. We take refuge under the shadow of His wings. Again, the picture here is, is, is one of a flight to a place of refuge. With such haste, with such intensity on our part, with the effort of our whole will, not letting anything prevent us from going there. That's where we should be. I mean, is it not the only place to go in this world in light of God's total trustworthiness and love for us? Where else are you going to go? We go to Him for refuge, for, for all kinds of things, for from all evil, from all harm, from all sin, from all things including hell and death, the devil himself. Let us run like a beeline under the Lord's protection and nestle down there under, under His strong and, and protective wings. Let us literally hide ourselves in Christ there. You might remember the scene in which uh, Jesus used this very imagery of Psalm 36 when he lamented for his nation, Luke 13, 34. There our Lord said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. 
The masses of Jesus' day missed that great blessing. They rejected their Messiah. I trust nobody here this morning would be like them. It's a wonderful thing to humble oneself in the shadow of the Almighty's wing. And having all the Godhead and all of its loving kindness and faithfulness and righteousness and judgments surrounding you throughout life. Indeed, how precious we find the loving kindness of the Lord. In Psalm 91.4, we read these words. He shall cover you with his feathers, speaking of the Lord. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. In other words, again, indicating complete protection from all harm. So, what do you and I find underneath the Almighty's wing? Well, verses 8 and 9, David points out there are four ways in which we are blessed in, by being there under God's wings. Those verses say they are abundantly satisfied. They, those who are under the wing, abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures, and for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. He lists four things there. Four things that we'll find beneath the shadow of the Almighty's wings. And first, there's satisfaction. There's satisfaction in life there. And basically, the idea of David trying to teach here is, is, is that by the, the might of a calm trust in God, the whole mass of a person's desires are filled. They're, they're satisfied. The big issues are answered. Whereas... Scripture contrasts that to the wicked who are never satisfied. But the one who trusts in the Lord can find ample satisfaction. And, and, and notice this too, uh, in these verses, David is not talking about the future blessing that comes from this shower of loving kindness. It's not to be just realized in some far off indefinite day to come, no, He's talking about what is possible even now in this present danger-filled world in which we live. In other words, these two verses, 8 and 9, describe a present and continuous enjoyment and fellowship with God and God's presence in our lives. There is satisfying abundance in God's house, that is, in God's presence in our lives. There's also, he lists joy, um, depending on your translation, it might be delights, verse 8, or pleasures. Trusting beneath the shadow of God's wing brings us to an ever-fresh flowing river of gladness is the idea here, and we can drink of that. It's a gladness that's altogether unlike that of the world around us, and, and by that gladness, all Christians should be characterized. Even, even in those times of sadness, which will intermittently come our way under the shadow of God's wings, joy, gladness is the very foundation of your life and my life in Him. You see, our, 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 our real possession, our, 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 our real profound communion with God in, in Christ will make us glad. The more we come into fellowship with Him, the more we will share the very joy of God Himself. Oh, you know, what a blessing it is for us to have a river, a source of joy that cannot be cut off. It can't dry up. It can't become muddy or corrupted like the stagnant pools of earthly joy. Such joy, such pleasures begin in our life now, and they will come into full bloom when we are in His presence. 
He also lists another blessing of that in verse 9, is life. For with you is the fountain of life in your light. We see light. It's a fountain of life. Picture there being God's salvation, His, His continuing mercy to His people. It's very frequently described as life-giving water. See that in the prophets. Where there is life, there is God. Uh, verse 9, a short verse, but the Bible scholar Stuart Perone says this about it. He says, in this verse are some of the most wonderful words in the Old Testament. Their fullness of meaning no commentary could ever exhaust. They are, in fact, the kernel and the anticipation of much of the profoundest teaching of the Apostle John. Indeed, Spurgeon says, this verse is made of simple words, but like the first chapter of John's Gospel, it is very deep. So let's not gloss over those. You kind of see the fullness of this, as they said, you know, you see it kind of expanded through the teaching of John in the beginning of his Gospel, where he writes of Jesus in him was life, and that life was the light of men. In this world, you know, there is such a thing as death in life. <laughs> I mean, living men may be dead in trespasses and sin, can be dead in pleasure, dead in selfishness. There are people full of energy with regard to, to worldly things who are yet all dead spiritually, dead to the realities which they have never seen, the actions which they have never done, Christ the emotions of which they've never felt being under that wing. And, and maybe it is hard to doubt that John did not have this psalm in mind as uh, God used him to write his gospel because in that prologue he does make clear that the life spoken of is both physical, since Christ created everything that was made, and spiritual, since they were children of God born not of natural descent, not of human will or decision, but born of God. Life both physical and spiritual. There is ongoing life in the shadow of God's outstretched wing. That's what David is trying to get across to us. And there's also light, light. In communion with God in His Word, the Lord gives Natural light to us, obviously, but he gives us intellectual and spiritual light. And, and quite frankly, he alone can make life bright. He alone can make our lives lustrous. In spiritual things, the knowledge of God sheds a light on all other subjects, in fact. No, we never see Jesus by the light of ourselves, but we see ourselves in the light of Jesus. Again, Alexander McLaren points this out. In communion with Him, who is the light as well as the life of men, we see a whole universe of glories and realities and brightness. Communication with God doesn't bring about with it a superior intellectual perspicuity, but it does bring a perception of spiritual realities and realities otherwise unseen. See, in communication with God, we see light upon all of our life, all aspects of our life. And the person who lives near to God gets to know what course to follow in life. And, and we get to see His light in all seasons of our lives, whether those are, are seasons of darkness or, or perhaps seasons of sorrow. And there is no place, no place except under the shadow of God's wings that you and I can find these kinds of blessings that are described for us by David in Psalm 36. Satisfaction, gladness, life, and light. So, yeah, yeah, we, we find ourselves living in a world fraught with all kinds of threats to our well-being, uh, both physical and spiritual. And, and, and honestly, it's sometimes easy to panic like a little barnyard chick that gets cut off from its connection with its mother, find itself running to and fro, confused and forlorn. But that needn't be. Needn't be. And you know, I, you know I, I'm aware of the fact that there are some, 
There are some of God's children who have allowed worry to become so ingrained in their thinking that it almost transcends their ability to think reasonably. Take, for instance, the woman who was convinced that she had this incurable disease. She goes to the doctor to find out about it. The doctor says, nope, after examination, woman, you're fine, you're healthy as can be. Besides, the doctor says, you know, you wouldn't even know if you had this particular disease because it has absolutely no discomfort of any kind. Oh, my goodness, the woman gasps. That's exactly my symptoms. <laughs> Listen, even when we find ourselves ultimately in a difficult, perhaps even a life-threatening situation, worry and anxiety is not the answer. From His Word, we know that God does have a purpose and a plan for you and me, and we also know that He has the power to carry out that plan. Of course, His overarching purpose for all believers, including you and me, is to conform us to the likeness of His Son, Romans 8, 29. But, but in that process, as that process is accomplished, He also has a specific purpose for every one of you. That is His unique, tailor-made plan for your life. Ephesians 2.10. Now, knowing that, knowing that, take then and overlay this steady, boundless, loving kindness of God over your life. View your life from the safety and security of remaining in the shadow of His wings through intimate fellowship with Him. Yeah, I, I know we don't, we don't know what lies around the corner. We don't know what might befall us tomorrow. But even though we might find ourselves hurting, even though we might find ourselves defeated at times, we must never lose sight of who we are in Christ. Personalize this psalm. I would encourage you, personalize this psalm and, and, and take verse uh, 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, I will take refuge. I will put my trust under the shadow of your wings. So throughout your journey here on this earth, let me ask you this. Can you ever exhaust God's loving kindness toward you? You know the answer to that. No. Will God ever abandon you? No. Even in our failures, our Heavenly Father's love is constant. You know, it was the prophet Jeremiah who in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of affliction, Judah at the time, Jeremiah reaffirms the very thought that David has here for us. In Lamentations 3, 21, he says, This I recall to mine, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Speaking of God. The same thing David has said right here. In Psalm 9:10, we find this. We say, And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should, given what we just read in Psalm 36, because it's another Psalm of David. <laughs> those who know who God is and what his character is like will put their trust in him and live under that shadow, underneath the shadow of His mighty wing. So let's end with this. Because we know that God is directing our lives to an ultimate end, and because we know that He is sovereignly able to orchestrate the events of our lives toward that end, we can trust Him. We can commit to Him not only the ultimate outcome of our lives, 
but also all the intermediate events and circumstances that will bring us to that outcome. Why? Why can we do that? Because of His precious loving kindness toward us. We really can live peacefully under the shadow of His almighty wings. Indeed, there and there alone we know that we are safe and secure. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be in your family, to experience the boundless loving kindness you have directed in our direction. Lord, sometimes we lose sight of that, sometimes we complain, sometimes we, we forget what a loving and kind God you are. In your graciousness, in your mercy, you have been showered upon us. Lord, help us to live our lives daily in recognition of your great loving kindness, knowing that you intend nothing but the best for us. And Lord, may we give you praise throughout life's journey, clinging to your loving kindness as we live our entire lives underneath the shadow of your mighty wings. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.